Off at A, Facebook, Chris Barnett from the KUAM News team. Off at A, Sabrina Salas and Matt Tanani. And I could just feel the history uh, in the air here at the University of Guam, uh, Cabo history. Fieldhouse. The herstory, sorry. <laughs> the herstory. That's right. That's going to take some getting used to. As uh, you know, uh, people are already starting to uh, come in here to the UOG Cabo Fieldhouse uh, for this historic inauguration. Of course, uh, Guam's first uh, woman governor, uh, Guam's first openly gay lieutenant governor, actually, the first openly gay lieutenant governor in the nation. In the nation. That's uh, pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, earlier today, uh, they swore in the uh, Democratic supermajority, also a female majority in the legislature. And there was a moment when the camera had in one shot the heads of the three branches of government, the judicial uh, branch, of course, with uh, Chief Justin, uh, Catherine, J Justice Catherine Merriman, uh, you know, uh, Governor uh, Lulia Guerrero, and then uh, Speaker of the Legislature, uh, Speaker Tina Munia Barnes, all three heads of state all women and you know my heart kind of skipped a beat there Brie. It, it certainly did and, and some of the things that uh, the speaker touched upon were about uh, female empowerment. She started off her speech um, with first recognizing 70 year, 75 years of freedom and thanking all of our elders that were watching uh, for their contributions to our community and just just to how we enjoy the freedoms that we do today. She also talked about the two people that inspired her and gave her her start in politics, first being Governor Carl Gutierrez. She told a story that she was working at the Department of Integrated Services for actually no the public defender's office right. and she got a call uh, from a that right of uh, right from governor Gutierrez and Dissid was actually created by then senator Lulian Guerrero and so uh, Carl told her that he needed somebody with a big heart and Dina responded, well, I am that woman. The other person that she thanked, of course, was her father, the late Bill Munia, who taught her life lessons that she applies in life and in leadership. She said that being speaker is more about listening than speaking and hearing both sides of a debate, enforcing rules and ensuring that everyone's voice is heard. And she said that you have to be honest even when it hurts and to respect one another. She talked about the work that lies ahead, the 35th Guam legislature, have, how they have to re-energize the economy, reform our government, make change our friend and not our, our enemy. She also talked about choices that they make. They must be open and honest and subject to the bright light of scrutiny and that they will collaborate with the Leon Guerrero Tenorio administration. On female empowerment, she said that through the years, politics have been dominated by men. There is a need for women representation. No one can advance women issues than women themselves. And she actually quoted somebody. That was words from Lou Leon Guerrero, and she said that she ran for governor and she won. She said that we've doubled the numbers in the legislature and today we have made history. We are joining the ranks of pioneers who set the standard that we must uphold, recognizing Cecilia Bamba, Elizabeth Ariola, Candelaria Rios, Agatha Johnston, Gloria Nelson, Ignacia Bordalio Butler, Maria Palomo, Ada, Speaker Judy Wanpat, and of course, Congresswoman Madeline Bordalio. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting um, when we talk about this wave of women leadership that hit Guam in 2018-2019, uh, mm -hmm. and then they go back and mention all the great female leaders that are sprinkled throughout our history. So I kind of was sitting there saying, like, you know, we've had a lot of great uh, women uh, leaders throughout the history of Guam, uh, you know, community leaders, uh, civic leaders, uh, you know, political leaders. Uh, and so it really, it was just... Um, kind of swelled my heart, you know, and, and I, one of the, the feelings I'm getting here is uh, the Democrats are kind of saying that they finally did it. I mean, they were able to fold uh, Carl Gutierrez um, into, uh, you know, he, it's no secret, he never really endorses the Democratic primary winner. They were able to do it, and that's kind of the feeling is there's a real sense of unity here in the OG Cabo Fieldhouse, uh, and that the Democratic Party, which is traditionally splintered, managed to unify itself enough uh, to win. And, you know, we, we, um, we talked with some people uh, who have uh, worked with the Gutierrez administration. They said, hey, you know, it's been 16 long years. We did it and we're back. And I think today is going to be a uh, celebration not only of uh, Magahaga and, you know, Femalawan rising, but also of uh, the Democrats uh, coming 
uh, back into power in both the legislature and uh, the executive branch. And, and they're really ready to get to work. So later you'll hear from some of the people we spoke with uh, earlier today about how they're energized and they're ready to go take on some of the issues that are confronting our island. And already uh, there was a release that came out just before uh, uh, the inauguration today, the ceremony, from uh, the Leon Garo Tenorio administration that the governor will be out at the Department of Revenue Taxation tomorrow morning to visit with employees, to visit with the, the director, Daphne Shimizu, and uh, Michelle Santos. Yeah, so definitely uh, hitting the ground uh, running. I know they have a flag raising um, uh, tomorrow morning. The legislature, uh, you know, hey, the women oh, got to work too. They introduced, I think, 13 uh, bills uh, this morning. So, uh, you know, we are celebrating, but at the same time, I like it that uh, we're also moving forward with, uh, you know, the work of the people. And as we look forward, we're also going to take a look back. Our Nestor Lacanto, he's working on this uh, special, television special, The Governors of Guam. We have uh, some of the clips from that show. Let's take a look. I did not walk alone. The chief that greatly said the people of Guam The people of Guam gave me the privilege to serve them and gave me the mandate to work with the members of the legislature, both Democrats and Republicans, and the state stakeholders, so that we can meet the challenges for time to deliver, de deliver the things that the people of Guam deserve to have. And it is not easy, because the only way you can deliver the greatness of the people is to work with members of the legislature and stakeholders. And it is not easy. You, I can just imagine, I go back and imagine the days where we had to debate the issues, where we disagree, where we had to compromise the long hours, the options, that was a long walk. And, but when you do, when you're focused on achieving something, you can overcome anything if you are able to, and willing to compromise, to work with the stakeholders and spend the time until you're able to achieve it. It's not always perfect. You don't always get it, but it's, it's there for the taking. And I, I have to say that we were very fortunate to do all these things. That's why we, we had the greatest economy during our time. And it's not because of me walking alone. It's with all the stakeholders. It's, and it's not me or the people, uh, it, it is not me, it is the people and the historian that will determine my legacy. And I hope after 25 years when I pass on to a new life, and I hope my God would allow me into the gate of heaven but one thing for sure though, I owe the people of Guam a debt of gratitude for allowing me to serve them. This honor I will never, never forget and will treasure it forever. The can-do governor. Uh, I don't take the, the, the rules and regulations and stumbling blocks as the final answer, uh, you know, and, and think that, uh, oh, because they said, oh, this, this letter said you can't do this, the Fed said you can't do that, and then you, you end up there and, and just say, okay, I can't do that because the letter said that. And I, I'll give you a good example of, of how I'm able to, to bring the people of Guam into the 20th century. This is 95, 96, just before the 20th century goes out, right? I said, this, our people has to be pulled in to the 20th century before you hit 2000. And thousands of people are still, you know, isolated, no, in the jungles, 
no running water, no roads, no power, no telephones. And I said, why, I, why are these people left out? Why are they marginalized so? Bringing people, uh, the entire island, as, as one family, never marginalizing anyone. Being able to be a real and true Magalahi. Because a real and true Magalahi, as we know it in our culture, is the chief of the village, the governor of Guam, whatever you want to call them. But he has to be uh, uh, you know, accessible and be in the public square. Standing there so people can come and talk to you, tell you their, their problems, and hopefully you can make things right for them. So I, 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 that's what I was. I mean, I was a real Magalahi. My wife was the, Jerry Gutierrez was a real Magalahi. So being accessible to the people to listen to them and let them tell you their problems, because not only are you gonna help them, you make them feel that they matter. I tended to be a, a lot more conservative than media, which I consider to be liberal. So the relationship uh, between uh, my administration in my first term, especially, and the media was, was not as good as it could have been. But um, beyond that, you know, uh, uh, when, you, when, you, when I look at that issue versus everything else, it, it just pales in comparison to all the other challenges. Um, when a man is laid to rest in his final days, he doesn't look back and think, I should have worked harder. I should have put more effort into this or into that. I think what um, one values more so are relationships with those that really uh, matter to you, your family, and those that you care for. And, uh, you know, and so with my family, if there's any regret, it was always the fact that it took up so much of my time to be governor. And so people don't realize it, but to be in a leadership position requires a sacrifice. And oftentimes you sacrifice your family. They pay the price because you can't give them the attention and the time that they need because you, you're, you're responsible and caring for everyone else. I remember having a conversation that with my kids saying, we don't see much of you uh, anymore. You're always at work or you're, you're traveling or you're, you're in meetings and uh, you can't take a phone call. And I had to tell my, my daughter, the youngest one then is, I, I'm sorry, but you are my children, and, uh, but I have a bigger family now, and that's the people of Guam, so you have to sacrifice along with me. And uh, so that's always, the, the I, I think, the biggest regret is not um, finding enough balance for everything else because you get so consumed in your role as governor. Good Lord has given every single individual in this, in, this, in, this, in this world a unique talent, a unique skill. So you, you make the most of it. But then being a governor and you make a decision, especially ones that, that are breaking the status quo, there are millions of different things that could happen or not happen that can affect what will happen as a result of that decision that is pivotal. So you can think all the possible angles of you make this decision, what may happen or may not happen. And it, you know, it's, it's pretty, pretty significant. So all that's left is then that quiet meditation and then prayer. And it's amazing after prayer, uh, then you wait for the silence. And every major decision I've made, that answer came to me. If, you want, if you're asking about an epiphany, that one moment, it came with silence. The government that I, I leave to the next administration, the island that we all live in, that I step away, that this island, this government, and our people, that it is better off than it was when I first came in. That's my hope.
and we're here with uh, Mr. David Della Sola, who is the uh, appointee, uh, the Leon Guerrero Tenorio appointee uh, chosen to lead the Department of Labor. Well, first of all, uh, congratulations. Thank you, and I appreciate uh, the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor for their uh, confidence in me. And uh, you've actually uh, done this job before, and you know, when um, Lou talked about the experience and then the youthful energy uh, that, you know, comprises uh, her cabinet level. Uh, she was talking about experience and, and talking about what you're bringing to the table. Well, I also hope I bring some youthfulness uh, into it. Just a but little. Yes, just a little <laughs> bit. Yes, I got 12 years in. I had uh, five years in DYA and uh, three and a half years in the Department of Labor and four years in uh, Agency for Human Resources Development. So, yes, I have uh, 12 years in uh, director experience and uh, with seven of it at labor itself. Nice. And so uh, Department of Labor, uh, you know, there's a ton of issues uh, that involve Department of Labor. What are some of the things that you're excited to work on moving forward? Of course, we're going to continue and, and develop our close relationship with the military and in their, getting their help with our H-2s and work with the Congress and, uh, and the, also the governor who's also working with uh, Washington about getting our H-2s not only for inside the fence but also outside the fence. And also we like to make sure that we get in all our unemployment and employment reports in and uh, we are hoping to get together and start working on meeting and get some of our worker comp cases taken care of and wage and hour issues taken care of. So we do have a lot of work to do, but they're, they are also doing some good things there still. Uh, I'm curious if you've had a chance to meet uh, with your team at uh, Department of Labor and what was that, what was that like? Yes, uh, I was part of the transition team. So I've uh, met with pretty much all the administrators down there and uh, discuss what their are, challenges are. Of course, a lot of the challenges is the decreased staffing. They are probably almost 25 to 30 percent less uh, employees than when I was there uh, years ago. So uh, we have to kind of see what our priorities are and kind of know that we can't do everything in every division, but we should prioritize and organize and see what we can do and make sure that we do those that what is important to the people and what needs to be done especially in like in workers comp and wage an hour and enforcement uh, those are things that we really need to pay attention to nice. well thank you so much and uh, good luck and we look forward to seeing you uh, a lot in the next four years and I look forward to uh, serving the people of Guam thank you very much well, it was on Sunday that we uh, did a special, we broadcast a special edition of the After Party where we interviewed Governor-elect Lulian Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Josh Tenorio. Here's a portion of that interview. So I'm excited. I'm excited uh, to what's going to happen in this year. And Josh and I are, are you know, running. We're, we're right there. We're urgent about stuff. And, you know, we know exactly what our platform is, what we want to do. We're going to focus really heavily on finances. We're going to look at ways that we can cut costs, and we're already finding ways. And, uh, you know, look at funding that is not being used, that should be used. A lot of federal monies that was returned back to the government, about $49 million. Josh will probably talk about it more, but he's going to be heading the state clearinghouse. Nice. And um, he's already looking at really good people to run that, and he's going to be focused on that because that's federal dollars that we can use to provide better service. You know, the whole IT of the government, I'd like to totally reassess that, review that. Uh, see how we can make it work so people talk to each other, you know. For example, Department of Land Management, their system's not talking to the Department of Revenue and Tax, so they don't have up-to-date uh, information about change of titles, that kind of stuff. We're losing uh, revenues from that. We're losing revenues from condominiums. Just a lot of leakage, I think, that right. it's not hard to close. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think you just have to have the persistence and the diligence to be right there. So we're working very closely with those people. For my reset for uh, federal funds, you know, I said at that debate that there was over 40 million, 49 million dollars that was um, returned. So the way I envisioned the clearinghouse is really like an intervention team. I'll have accounting people there. I'll have program people. I'll have procurement people there, people that can see in advance 
uh, what agencies are maybe underperforming uh, and try and get in there and try and push it up. So some people have said, ah, you need to go out and bring the money, but I think that we need to spend the money that we're getting. Right. So that's my refresh for Clearinghouse. And for beautification, I think it's gonna be uh, working front line with the mayors. We're moving them back to Adeloupe after 16 years. Uh, you know, there's some funds and resources out there that I'd like to, you know, get out. And I tell you, when I've been canvassing, especially up here up north, in the Chamorro Lantris areas, there's a lot of cleaning up to do. And if we're gonna have, uh, if we're gonna have our young people feel good about the place that we live in, we better clean it up to, so they can be proud of it. So, right. uh, but on the other side, you know, I came from the court. I've always been leading both here and nationally a lot of criminal justice reform efforts. So I'll be focusing a lot on um, working a lot with the team that we have in place. I'm very excited about it. I think we have a high performing team, right. um, both up there and in DYA uh, that will be announced shortly and um, changing the way that we're handling people, looking at people for people and not treating them as numbers, trying to get some uh, effective programming in there so we can drop the crime and drop recidivism. I'll be spending a lot of time in those areas. And then of course, I've been helping the governor push um, and uh, helping her sort out the administration, so I'll be using my office to help her lead the government, so I'm, I'm happy. And you can watch the full interview with Governor Lulian Guerrero and Lieutenant Governor Josh Shinorio right now on our YouTube page as well as on our Facebook page. It's a special edition of The After Party. With us now is the program director for the big event today, the inauguration, Cliff Guzman. How are you doing? Doing well. Actually doing well. We've got a great team cranking here and uh, everything's falling into place. Take Just us through um, today's program. Well, uh, today's program, we're going to start with, of course, recognizing all the right. distinguished visitors. And then we're going to introduce all the special guests as they mm -hmm. come on stage, which is going to be a lot of fun. We're going to do that to the Guam March. More appropriate. <laughs> what's more appropriate? And uh, then the big event when the, the Senate governor-elect and the governor-elect come out, of course. And that's going to be really exciting. We want to pump that up. And then um, we've got a couple of things in, you know, some cultural things going on. It's, it, there's a lot of stuff. And then the big event, the real big event, the administrations of the oaths. And, um, you know, everything kind of centers around that. And then we have very special gifts that have been put together by three of Guam's masters. Um, and Jill Beneventi, Joe Guerrero, and Greg Pangolina. And so those are going to be presented to the... Uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor, the Governor, and the First Gentleman, or First Dude. First <laughs> and so those are going to be presented and um, if an alliance is going to come up and they're going to do a very special chant for that. So there's going to be a lot of fun things. And then of course you got to, once they're in and they're sworn in, and then it's all about the confetti and the yay, you know. The, the party. Yeah, the party. The celebration. A lot of food out here. Uh, we have enough to feed two, three thousand people easily and lots of entertainment too as well. It's a celebration. Yeah. You know, first woman to come, uh, Governor Magahaga, you know, it's a, uh, wow, yeah. that's pretty cool. Yeah. And uh, and then, you know, uh, got first lieutenant governor, youngest lieutenant governor, mm -hmm. so that's a lot of fun, yeah. And so, you know, one of the things I thought was uh, really cool about uh, the inauguration is not a single public dime, I mean, generous uh, sponsors. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about the sponsors? You know, I have to tell you, the, the sponsors have been amazing. They've raised so much money. And, um, you know, of course, it's the issue is still, we've got Tony Sanford at the helm for Treasury, so it doesn't matter how much money you got, this is what you get to spend. <laughs> and uh, she's been really good about that. And so um, I think that's kind of a, a harbinger of uh, the administration. It doesn't matter if the money is we're not going to go out and spend it just because we have it. And uh, that's evident in everything that's been going on so far. Uh, there's been a lot of thought gone in, going into it and a lot of back and forth about do we really need to spend this, you know? Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. Well, I know one of the things that we heard, uh, we were speaking with some people, uh, one of the ushers, and they were talking about everybody has a uniform, everybody has these scarves uh, that they're, they're wearing. Tell us about the symbolism behind that. Well, I think the symbolism, it's got a little bit of that, that orange love, <laughs> you know? <laughs> But I think more importantly, we needed some way for, for people to, to be able to identify if they needed some help, and I don't know, where, where's the ladies' room, whatever that is. 
um, we had an opportunity to, to, to help them out. Right. But, um, you know, it's like anything else. If you have a team, you've got them in uniform, you've got them all pulled together. I mean, those uniforms really help build that team and ship, you know, right. a lot of pride. Right, and they were saying that some of the colors that are in the in the scarves represent the different democratic uh, different uh, administrations. administrations. Yeah, that, and, and then talking with um, one of the ushers, uh, they, they showed me, you know, okay, this color is for uh, the Bradalia administration, this one's uh, for Uncle Carl, and then uh, Lou and Josh, custom made. And I, I like that the guys have the ties and the ladies have the scarves. Yeah, yeah, why not, you know, I mean, I just like the idea of the teammanship that's gone into this because that's that's a really good thing. That's a great way to start. You got team. You got to have a team, you know, yeah. and they're excited about it. And you know, it's been 16 long years for the Democrats, and uh, um, why not proudly wear the colors, everyone's colors, you know? It's all so, good. So, what about you? Are you going to be uh, working in the administration? Me? No. <laughs> He's doing too good yeah. in the private sector. Well, the yeah, <laughs> private sector been good to me. Yes, right, that's right, true. Right. Yeah. But um, no, I think you know I'm 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 here to serve and help any way I can. Uh, there's a lot of great brains out there. We have a lot of young, young people coming up. They need to have that same opportunity I was given back in in Carl Gutierrez's day. You know, I was so honored to have that opportunity and got a lot done and I'm proud of it. And I think there's so much more that our people can give, and we all need to bring everyone together. That's the whole point of the scarves, isn't it? Right. Unity, bring everyone together, let's do this as one. Nice. Yeah. I'm sure if that, if that phone rings and it's Adloop calling and they need, you know, Cliff's advice on something, you won't hesitate to give that advice? Oh, absolutely not. I, I didn't hesitate through any administration. I helped Joe Adda to call when Felix Camacho called, when uh, Eddie Calvo called, yes. Yeah, it's about Guam, it's not about your party. Right. It's about Guam, you know. But today is about the party because we're we are having a party <laughs> we're, later. We're, you know, we you got know, what entertainment. What did some other radio broadcaster who won't mention his name said? Party Democrat and <laughs> do whatever else with the Republican. <laughs> Well, speaking of the party, we're going to go ahead and throw it over to the live broadcast on KUM TV 11, also streaming right here on our KUM News Facebook page in partnership with PBS Guam. Viva! Party Democrat.